Especially of an animal in a wild state after escape from captivity or domestication. Alcatraz, Arab Spring, one billion rising. Freedom schools, the Maroons, rebellion thriving. We've been rising since the dawn of creation. Sun in the blood of our veins, liberation runs from Muhammad. Welcome to Feral Visions, a decolonial feminist podcast brought to you by Liberation Spring. I'm your host, Anjali Nathupadia. We begin with a content note or trigger warning. Here at Feral Visions, we go deep, and that often means courageously addressing white supremacist, imperialist, heteropatriarchal, capitalist, settler, colonial violence in order to support healing and transformation. Bypassing isn't an option. The only way is through. The time for denial is over, and today's a great day to keep it real. Amidst the show's focus on unapologetic truth-telling, then, please practice excellent self and community care while listening. To start our inquiry into the role of context in discernment, Let's talk about feminist and indigenous epistemologies. I'm going to share some important theory and then we can break it down. Flourishing philosophical attention exists surrounding feminist epistemologies. What's up, Steffi? Good to see you. Which, by the way, need to be historically situated within the broader study of knowledge construction as located within, in Western philosophy, some hegemonic canonical structures. Feminist literature approaches some of the following questions. What is truth? In quotation marks. And who has access to it? What are valid sources of knowledge production? Who are conceived of as legitimate sources of epistemic authority, being capable of knowing, being capable of creating knowledge? One recurring theme of feminist epistemic work is the rejection of traditional takes on objectivity and relativism in lieu of a more contextualized alternative. So one of the noteworthy contributors to this field is the Panamanian American philosopher, Dr. Linda Martin Alcoff, who I had the pleasure of meeting and opening for at our 2010 Cal State Fullerton Annual Philosophy Symposium that was on phenomenology, race, and embodiment. As an aside, I bring up that conference from a decade ago because I know a lot of people with sincere intentions are trying to learn about race and embodiment right now and unfortunately are getting scammed by monetized trainings in the field of so-called somatics that can be really anti-intellectual. So taking it back to the fields of phenomenology, though, we are capable of rigor. So as Professor Alcoff and Elizabeth Potter note, in their introduction to the 1992 anthology called Feminist Epistemologies, some primary questions asked by the field are the following. Who is the subject of knowledge? How does the social position of the subject affect the production of knowledge? What is the impact upon knowledge and reason of the subject's sexed body? Is all knowledge expressible in propositional form? We'll talk about what that means in a minute. How can objectivity be maximized if we recognize that perspective can't be eliminated? 
Are the perspectives of the oppressed epistemically privileged? Like, do oppressed people have access to certain kinds of knowledge or certain kinds of knowing that other people don't? There's a lot of talk about that in particular these days. How do social categories such as gender affect scientists' theoretical decisions? What's the role of the social sciences in the naturalization of epistemology? What's the connection between knowledge and politics? These questions are of utmost importance for all feminists and activists to be interrogating in the context of massive power imbalances in the political, economic, social, and psychic spheres. Feminist epistemology shows that these questions aren't solely considered by ruling class elites and philosophers deliberating from the exclusive space of the academy. Additionally, conceiving of knowledge production as a collective endeavor rather than individually pursued has been yet another substantial contribution of feminists to epistemic inquiry. Another hallmark of feminist interventions into epistemology includes highlighting the historically gendered distinction between the privileged knows that and the marginalized knows how forms of knowing. So in the pursuit of clearing a space for more egalitarian knowledge claims to emerge, the feminist philosopher Dr. Lorraine Code in her 1995 article titled Taking Subjectivity into Account elucidates some hidden hierarchical biases and patriarchal biases in traditional epistemic claims that are framed up in that S knows that P paradigm, where S stands for subject, a subject, like a human, and P for proposition, like the thing that we know. And Dr. Code asserts that a variable construction hypothesis requires for epistemologists to be paying just as much attention to the nature, the situation, the location of S, the subject, who is it that thinks that they know a thing, as much as is commonly paid attention to, to the context of P, like the unit of knowledge itself, something that you could look up on Wikipedia that people could think is just a simple fact or a data point. So as this essay's title demonstrates then, subjectivity has got to be taken into account. Code begins to demonstrate this variable construction hypothesis by explaining that mainstream Western epistemology or paradigms of knowing can be characterized by that S knows that P claim. And within such a framework, knowers themselves are kind of perceived as easily exchangeable. Right, which means that our social location would be irrelevant, like our race, our class, our gender, our age, our location, and so on and so forth. So that kind of hegemonic, enlightenment-based epistemology characterizes itself as purely objective. It's value neutral, it's occupying a view from nowhere, to borrow a term from Thomas Nagel, this godlike view, as if it is, right, totally fact-based, right, there's nothing subjective about it. So power dynamics, politics, and emotions then are irrelevant. Apparently, one can't even be said to know anything within mainstream epistemology if we're even engaging at all in the emotional realm. How limiting. 
So even within the Western canon, right, within Western European, right, theoretical traditions, a tremendous amount of resistance exists to this objective, quote unquote, and value free, emotionless epistemic hegemony. Many folks and different theoretical traditions have dissented from this monolithic approach to knowledge formation for legit millennia, right? Taking it back to its historical antecedents. We could be talking about Marxists saying like, I think the working class knows things that the bourgeoisie doesn't. To Plato, pragmatists, existentialists, Stoics, phenomenologists, Spinoza, even Hume. So feminists, for sure, aren't the first group of people to critique Western epistemic systems. Nonetheless, that S knows that P claim has proved wildly popular. Among who? Well, scientific supremacists, such as positivists, more on who the hell they are later in the season, who belittle value. Like, I care about the earth. I care about all living beings. I care about myself. I care about y'all. That gets belittled. That makes us less objective, allegedly, according to this mainstream framework. And they dichotomize between what they perceive to be this distinction, right, separating facts from values, kind of like some of what I was just naming. So Professor Code, for example, historicizes those claims as stemming from this epistemology that's positivist and empiricist. And again, we're going to unpack what on earth those terms mean later in the season which are attempting to quantify knowledge, quantity over quality. And in that format, so then why? What can they do? They can predict, they can manipulate, they can control what they consider facts. In actuality, that very idea of so-called objectivity originates in a positivist inspired notion of scientific knowledge. So Professor Code explains that for those epistemological purists, evidence from our lived experiences or personal testimonies belong in the sociology of knowledge not in the fields of epistemology. Like, those are cute stories, but they're not facts. They're not the stuff that real knowledge or data is based off of. You'll see the value judgments at play here that are pretending to not exist. So that kind of orthodoxy, right, what philosophers call positivism when it comes to different approaches to knowing or to wisdom, right, or to authority or expertise, they really inform mainstream public conceptions of objectivity, along with widely held beliefs in the supremacy of science and technology. More on that later when we talk about scientism as a weed to be pulled later in the season. So within that kind of positivist, empiricist paradigm, true, quote unquote, knowledge is context independent, or so it would like to posit. Logical positivism has always had a subject. Historically, this subjecthood has been occupied by upper or ruling class, heterosexual, white, cis male researchers and intellectuals, and they so often, right, have presumed that the technical merits of that framework mean that it's not even important to know in other kinds of ways, like relationally, for example, knowing other people, 
knowing ourselves, knowing with the earth or with the biome that we're rooted in. More on that soon when we talk about indigenous epistemologies in a minute. Nor do they provide guidance for how esoteric propositions actually figure into our everyday lives. To be clear, that kind of logical, positivist epistemology doesn't yield pragmatic knowledge, nor particularized, localized knowledges. So it's not about knowing how, like, how to do a thing. It's just knowing a thing in the abstract, like we were talking about as being super dangerous on Wednesday when we were getting into co-optation. It's much easier to co-opt something important and meaningful when people are just playing an abstraction in a way that is ungrounded, in a way that's not rooted. So more on that rooting in just a minute. So as opposed to right, knowing how to do something, weave a basket, for example, grow food, just knowing some abstraction, right, like a platonic form, right, riffing off of Plato that's allegedly just floating in the universe for people to observe, that gets put on a pedestal here. And can you guess what some of the gender dissociations are, right, and some of the colonial associations are? Like, who just knows things in the abstract versus who knows how to do things, right? Historically, that knowing how, right, is associated with colonized peoples, more so than with colonizers. It's associated, right, in a cis hetero gender binary with cis women and girls, right, whereas, right, cis men and boys are allegedly more likely to know this rarefied, pure, right, fact based, objective, right, knowledge. So, marginalized and alternative knowledges are bulldozed to render a homogenous and a uniform account of the world. So what's an alternative to that kind of philosophical bullying? Professor Code proposes feminist epistemologies that what? That acknowledge their political investments and that are accountable to communities. She believes that gender via intersectionality has to be a central analytic category considering that knowledge production is sexed, right? Sex, gender, sexuality, they're relevant to how we know. And additionally, hybridized forms of relativism and empiricism are called for lending insight into the pursuit of a kind of feminist empiricism that might be free of that kind of super problematic positivism that fronts as being objective. We see this all the time around us in the mainstream culture today. We'll talk about a few specific examples of that shortly. So those kind of egalitarian ventures would endeavor to explore the realms of emotion, connection, practicality, sensitivity, and idiosyncrasy, which have been all but omitted from the markedly exclusive ideals that accompany those outdated Western epistemic discourses. There, overrepresented subjectivity of those who've historically used the opportunity of their epistemic authority to generalize their experiences as indicative of objective reality, quote unquote, get exposed when we take subjectivity into account like this. And they get exposed especially for marginalizing dissent, which they regularly do. It should be relatively clear then that knowledge is influenced by its knowers, that this is inevitable and that there's nothing wrong with this. 
feminist epistemologies would then require asking, who is the we that knows, including who's the S in that S knows that P kind of claim? So why else would epistemologists need to be urgently asking these questions about knowers and more rigorously examining the relationship between knowledge and power? Well, for one, positivist, empiricist epistemologies support, at the societal level, liberal ideas of individualism and tolerance. Professor Code explains that, quote, these ideals and values shape both the intellectual enterprises that the society legitimates and the language of liberal individualism that maps out the rhetorical spaces where those enterprises are carried out, end quote. Centering that tendency in our knowledge production and remembering is actually pretty limiting. So one broad sociopolitical reason for highlighting epistemic inquiry is simply based on my interest in people more rigorously scrutinizing questions of knowledge production in our everyday lives. That helps in decentralizing structures of authority that might be hegemonic and instead empowering our communities and individuals for our own autonomous organization. It also problematizes that idea of rugged individualism when it comes to the idea of authorship, right? Because feminist and indigenous epistemologies would say that knowledge is created collectively, not just some solo genius sitting in an office by themselves that has some epiphany in isolation, right? That's a pretty capitalist mythology, kind of as American as apple pie. We can set that down and be a little more humble right, when it comes to this kind of topic. So regardless of various aspects of social location, most people have the capacity to sensibly problem solve within our given context, privileges, and oppressions. So we need to realize the danger of acquiescing to power structures with regulatory control over our lives that try to do meaning making for us. They should merit serious and sustained suspicion, if you ask me. Collective liberation is aided by creating a vehicle through which previously marginalized worldviews, understandings of reality, and kinds of knowledges can be remembered, can be formulated, and can be reflected upon. Let's strengthen and continue the conversation of us remembering our own knowledge spaces and recognizing that they can serve as their own epistemic sources of authority. Regardless of the liberatory project being pursued, People have the ability to think more clearly for ourselves about what constitutes knowledge and where it's derived. And doing that seems like one move in a direction towards a more just society. So some of what I just shared is often called standpoint epistemology, like taking our standpoint or our position or our location or subjectivity into account. And it's often associated with the UCLA professor, Dr. Sandra Harding, also Dr. Maria Lugones, also Dr. Mariana Ortega, and countless other researchers in this field. Let's apply some of their insights around attention to context so that we can sharpen our capacity, right, to perceive with more discernment. And so if it helps your memory, you can imagine this as, right, a seed that would allow us to see the forest as opposed to solely one tree that's right in front of us. Because the thing is, 
What happens when folks are oblivious to context? Let's get into a few specific examples. People can misunderstand, say, conservative reactionaries, whether it's Trump, Joe Rogan, Howard Stern, as if they're rebels. Bullying oppressed peoples can get coded as brave. How ridiculous. So for me to say that out loud, as clearly as I just did, likely lays bare how absurd that misunderstanding is. Really punching down as some kind of renegade act instead of just acting like a mean jerk? This happens often with comedy, where people that might actually be acting a little bit cowardly aren't confronting corporations or militaries or picking on someone their own size, so to speak. And if they really perceived themselves as tough guys or had any legit confidence in their capacity to begin with, why would they be doing that? And so to begin to sort of parse out what's going on there, this is almost like what back in the day was called, right, looking at context clues. That was definitely a thing when I was in secondary school. I don't know if any of y'all remember that. Uh, and so what might that encourage us to take seriously? This is kind of like something that Professor Boaventura de Sosa Santos talks about in his book, Epistemologies of the South, when he says that here's something we need to be doing, quote, right, taking seriously, the need for a constant theoretical vigilance that submits ideological references to the constant control of reality, end quote. So here, when he's talking about ideological references, he's talking about, right, as I interpret it, right, the way that we make meaning in the world, right, different worldviews or different ideologies that people subscribe to. And what is he saying, right, if we want to take, right, our worldview seriously, they've got to, right, be submitted to the constant control of reality, like taking our context seriously. And this ensures that we're rooted, could be rooted in time, like history, right, or temporality. Maybe it's being rooted in space, which includes power dynamics. Maybe it's being rooted in place, right, like our earthly, embodied geopolitics, and so much more. So context does include power dynamics. Paying attention to power dynamics is one of the most important components of context. Because if not, have you ever seen people drawing moral equivalences where none exist? It could be perceiving some kind of evenness that's actually erroneous. For example, if somebody is talking about, right, say, reverse racism, when in actuality, what they're really referencing is maybe some individual proclivity that might be prejudiced, but it's not like overnight, say, if somebody of an oppressed or racialized group, say, dislikes white people, it doesn't mean that all of a sudden, right, the pay gap transformed overnight, right, zip code-based discrimination and incarceration and quality of education and so on and so forth, right, environment toxicity changes immediately because somebody had a personal feeling <laughs> about people of a different group, right? So when we take seriously power dynamics, that component of our context, it's way less likely that we could end up inadvertently misunderstanding the world in that substantial of a way. Right? This is also super helpful if it comes to people using words out of context, like, for example, using the word shaman, which is rooted in Sanskrit, right, which today would be, right, emanating from present day Mongolia. And if people are just kind of sloppily talking about shamans, say, in the so called Americas or anywhere outside of, right, a Sanskrit based culture, right, or present day Mongolia, that's actually a dead giveaway.
that either one, they don't actually know what they're talking about, or two, they might actually be open to distorting the truth. It could be to sell us something, right, to seem more impressive for whatever reason, but I really invite us to not take the bait, to be able to take seriously context, like, hang on a minute, that doesn't even make sense in this setting. What are we missing out on, right, if we're just kind of cutting and pasting things in a way that can be a little sloppy like that. And so, right, this attention to context also includes checking our sources. For example, are we learning something in a space that's monetized, right? Is it through, say, a transactional relationship? as opposed to maybe a transformative or a transformational relationship, playing off of a distinction that Cooperation Jackson uses. And so, right, another gem to consider here is to pay attention to silences, to omissions, to what gets invisibilized, to what in mainstream economics gets called externalized costs. And what is an externalized cost? It's something that's not in, right, an equation as it's been framed up for us, like in the vast majority of economic calculuses. So often the equations at play will be how much money can we make this quarter for our corporation? And the externalized costs might be the impact on the planet, right, or the impact on laborers, right? So frankly, so often some of the most important factors actually end up as, right, externalized costs or externalized variables. So how can we be on the lookout for that subtext, right, for what might be in between the lines that's not getting explicitly stated? I'd really like for us to be on the lookout for those kinds of context clues. And when it comes to, right, that component of context that is time, like I alluded to earlier, that includes being situated historically. And I know that many of us might have studied history back in the day in school. Have any of y'all heard of the field of historiography? So this isn't just some pretentious academic synonym for history. Far from it. Let's break it down a little bit. So historiography as a field, right, attends to these different components of context that we've been talking about, right? So whereas a kind of simplistic take on history might just say, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, and then he discovered the Americas, right? The field of historiography would invite us to pause and instead of just kind of presuming, oh, those are the facts, that's all we need to know. We keep it data-driven, that's it. Nothing more to see here, we can move along, right? Historiography would ask us to pause and to see, wait a minute, what language are we speaking in right now? How does that inform what we're capable of knowing? Who wrote that history book, right? And who didn't write it? So this is like that idea, right, that so often, say in the so-called Americas, history books have gotten written by conquerors, by imperialists, not by the original peoples of the continents that were overwhelmingly stolen. So all of those different details are incredibly relevant if we want to have a more refined perception, not just taking, right, alleged facts at surface level as a given, but really kind of pausing to unpack some of these different facets of context. And so honoring context also requires acknowledging the role of institutions, right? Like institutional biases with some kind of knowledge created, say, in the academy. Because then that means that we know that, right, 
certain things get funded, other questions, right, and research projects don't get funded, right, certain things are allowed to be said, other things are substantially censored, right, so that's another kind of clue for us to be on the lookout for. What's the role of institutions, right, in determining what we currently know and what we don't? Uh, and, right, also systemic analyses, right, help us not get seduced by lies that can be super atomizing, like in a vacuum, right, that are totally acontextual or without context. So remembering that the personal is political, these bigger picture facets of reality are present even if we might not be acknowledging them in the moment. And so, again, it's not just about that kind of superficial take on history. We've also got to right, really consider who said a thing, what was the context, in what language, why were they saying it, to who, where, right, published where, if it was published, who was it published by, or if it was shared in an oral context through orality, Again, how is it funded, right? What strings might have been attached to the funding? What are the biases at play, right? How are we interpreting it? And so these are all really important questions for us. Say if we're reading something online and we really want to take seriously, right, just being a little bit more discerning in a context where, unfortunately, sometimes people can be a little bit gullible in a way that's dangerous, like not checking to see what's the source of this thing that I'm sharing on Facebook, for example. I don't know if any of y'all have noticed that. People just kind of sharing things out sort of quickly without pausing to see, is there some agenda here potentially, right? So it would be really helpful for us, let alone if we're attempting to get free pretty seriously, to attend to some of those variables. Because the thing is, for over half a millennium, Western European imperialists have forced their interpretation of universalism down the throats of much of the rest of the world's people with breathtaking arrogance. They tried to paint much localized attention to particularity as irresponsible, as just relativism. But it's not relativist to pay attention to details. Attention and to context allows us to honor things that can be complex and that can be nuanced, where there are a lot of different facets to look at. So this is kind of like, for example, when the legendary Ngugiwa Thiongo says, quote, language as culture is the collective memory bank of a people's experience and history, end quote, right? The author, her right, of the text, Decolonizing the Mind, the politics of language in African literature, right? The person that really promoted the idea of decolonizing our minds throughout the planet, um, someone that we'd be super well advised to be conversant with. So there he's talking about the significance of language, right? And some of y'all might know he really famously, right, decided at a certain point in his career to stop publishing in English and really asking, right, in his Kenyan context, what's at stake when people, right, just continue to buy into this colonial mentality that West is best and that English... English is a better language to be publishing in and to be thinking in, to be dreaming in, to be imagining in. That's not neutral at all, right? Uh, and so another example of this is actually something that was shared out, right? It's a legendary example of epistemology coming out of the Center for Pacific Island Studies, or CPIS, right? And the fields of Pacific Studies um, from Dr. David Gageo in particular of the Solomon Islands. Um, and I want to share actually a little bit of an excerpt of a pretty famous article to talk about, right, one take on Epistemologies from the Solomon Islands, actually, from this piece that he wrote with Karen Watson-Gageo 
uh, that's called How We Know. Quare rural villagers doing indigenous epistemology. So to begin to transition into a little bit of a talk around indigenous epistemology also, what can that teach us about context? Let's look at a little bit of what they have to say in this article. So they say in part, right, so in this context of, right, a village in the Solomon Islands in the Pacific, all knowledge is subjective knowledge in Kwara'e. There can be no detachment of the knower from the known as in mainstream Anglo-European epistemology as exemplified in logical positivism with its focus on quote unquote objective knowledge. And so they say that the Kwara'e regard the whole body as knowing and as an organ of knowledge creation, similar to Merleau Ponty and Lakoff and Johnson's notion of the embodiment of perspective. So when talking about embodied senses, right, they name in this context of the Solomon Islands, right, that in addition to the sort of five senses that people talk about in the US, there's also seeing the unseen or invisible, such as spirits, a gift or ability that extends the physical and temporal boundaries of physical seeing, seeing a person walk by in a flash that no one else sees as a communication of something to happen and seeing in a dream. Two kinds of dreams are recognized, regular dreams, which may or may not make sense in everyday terms, and psychic dreaming, which predicts a future reality and may come from an ancestral spirit or recently dead relative. The dreamer distinguishes between them by bodily symptoms associated with psychic dreams, which, which usually occur at particular points in a dream state, and psychic dreams are epistemologically important. And if the dreamer can't figure out their meanings, there are specialists in dream interpretation that will be consulted. And another kind of seeing involves seeing something, could be the nature of an illness, the outcome of an event, the image or shadow of a person, through a medium, could be clear liquid in a container, could be a ritually treated leaf, could be a stick, and that kind of seeing is known in part by traditional healers. Also, different kinds of hearing are recognized. So there's ordinary sound, and then also hearing human sounds that no one else hears. Could be very early in the morning, could be often while it's still dark, and those sounds can often be predictive of events that are about to happen, such as someone's death. Uh, and so that's just one example of so many that we could talk about where we can see immediately this is not directly corresponding with the approach to knowing and to knowledge that's mainstreamed, say, in a place like the settler colonial U.S. today. And so the thing is around that if we're not right attuned to some of those particular approaches to knowing, we can miss out on so much. Uh, and so I'd like to share actually a couple more examples in that vein that really merit our taking seriously. If we are down to zoom out to see the forest as opposed to just say one tree in isolation, like the take on knowing that's been framed up for us within the mainstream colonial culture, right? So I mentioned that one key component of context is place. And so another component of that context is being on this earth. And that groundedness is indispensable to ensuring that we're not making things up in a vacuum in a way that can be ecocidal, right? Or deadly for the earth. So this is something that Dr. Glenn Coltard talks about through the language of grounded normativity in red skin, white masks, rejecting the colonial politics of recognition. 
you can see here in this quote, he says, quote, I call this place-based foundation of indigenous decolonial thought and practice grounded normativity, by which I mean the modalities of indigenous land-connected practices and long-standing experiential knowledge that inform and structure our ethical engagements with the world and our relationships with human and non-human others over time. So there's one example, right? And something is echoed that somewhat similar if we listen to a co-founder of Soulfire Farm, Leah Penniman, when she discusses what she calls ecological humility, right? Or what Professor Keith Basso details in Apache Epistemologies in his book, Wisdom Sits in Places, right? The idea that is, right, characteristic within so many different native and decolonial takes on epistemology that, right, knowing is actually pretty place-based, right? It actually requires some earth-centeredness, perhaps some ecological literacy. And I bring this in in part because I know that, especially if you've been in some sort of metaphysical spaces or some right kind of self-proclaimed spiritual spaces, sometimes people can abstract in a way that's actually deeply divorced from the earth. So it could be hypothesizing about what is going on in the Pleiades, for example. And as someone that's right, classically trained as a philosopher, right, abstraction can be pleasurable, it can be interesting. I understand the appeal of it in many different ways. But the thing is, our planet is in danger right now. And so I really invite us to take quite seriously that component of context that is honoring our place on the earth, right, when it comes to taking perception more seriously, not just kind of buying into this Western European so-called enlightenment-based take on knowing that is so deeply ungrounded, that can just super casually encourage us to universalize in a way that doesn't honor, oh, there's actually a lot of particularity that merits taking seriously. If we want to even, if we're into the idea of objectivity, try to approach a strong objectivity to use the framework that Dr. Sandra Harding has been using for decades and she's intentionally playing with this kind of patriarchal language of strength and objectivity to invite people to recognize that all of this that we've been getting into, this actually enables us to have more explanatory power in terms of what we're talking about, to know what we're talking about even more than if we were to just bypass all of these different variables and be like, oh no, I'm just like objective, trust me. We don't have to take any of this into account. And this is something that we see so often in what some people call the culture wars within the broader society, where some people are so super resentful of having to acknowledge their social location. They want to go back to a time where they can just pretend that they're objective and they can just pretend to what, uh, that what they are saying is fact-based and they don't want to have to acknowledge, oh no, right, knowing is situated socially, right? Again, it's in part subjective, it is in part place-based, it is in part temporal, rooted in the historical moment that we're in this point, right, in time across whatever understanding of temporality we subscribe to. Uh, and so just wanting to bring in some of those different, right, facets of context for us to attend to, right, if we would like, 
for our meaning making to actually have more explanatory power. And unfortunately, right, again, like I alluded to, there's a whole lot of resistance to this in so many different spaces. And feel free to let me know in the comments if you have observed any of this, where people act like, for example, right, feminism and people of color talking, right, BIPOC sharing, right, some of our, right, observations in the world has basically destroyed civilization, it's destroyed education, right, now people allegedly don't know as much because we're talking about, right, race and class and gender so much, when in actuality we could much more, right, and citizenship and age and ability and sexuality and so many other facets of the prism through which we perceive or attempt to know anything, right? So as y'all are sitting with some examples that you might have observed within your own life, I could share a couple of instances, right, to kind of ground some of what I know was pretty theoretical, right, material today. So one personal example of this comes from a dialogue I had with my older brother when I was around 20 about Israeli settler colonialism. When I spoke to the history of the occupation that he was conveniently ignoring, he legit responded by saying, oh, you're letting history bias you. What a tragically thin attempt at argumentation. Some people regularly try to make things up in a void like this, but that endeavor lacks explanatory power. Again, context clues, remember? Or another example of this kind of tomfoolery that's particularly problematic, to be frank, occurred in an alleged yoga teacher training around 2015. A customer buying this service was interpreting some usage of the color green in a traditional Chinese medicinal context and why some tokenizing nod to TCM was part of a so-called yoga teacher training is a whole nother case study in anti-intellectual fluff that I'll bracket for now. But this customer said that the color green made her think of money so perhaps that was what this component of Chinese medicine was referencing. The business person selling this service responded by saying, what a beautiful interpretation. I found this horrifying. What cultural chauvinism. So to do a little unpacking, dollar bills in the settler colonial US are green. So people often associate the color green with currency in the US empire. This service was being bought and sold in the colonial state of California. And nobody said anything in the realm of even pausing to ask, oh, were you presuming that green was associated with money thousands of years ago in the land base that's now generally referenced as the nation state of China? Do we know that to be factually correct? There was zero attempt at any such rigor at all whatsoever. And the thing about that is, again, people can make things up in a vacuum, but that doesn't mean that they actually know what they're talking about. What do you notice from those couple of vignettes? First off, neither of these mishmashes would even get a passing grade in a 101 level university essay. It's sloppy to make things up in a way that's ignorant to historical archives, geopolitics, ecology, and the like. And the academy is insufficient in terms of standards for knowledge production, but even within the academy, that wouldn't actually count as a serious interpretation. And you know, some other compelling examples come from this QAnon situation in the moment. So when I hear people expressing, say, good faith concern about pedophilia, I want to wholeheartedly support them in acting on that concern. But what is the context in which a concern about child abuse is getting operationalized?
not cop training academies or the Catholic Church or other super well-documented cases. So what's up with that disconnect? Or another facet to look at with QAnon involves legitimate concerns about the government engaged in clandestine, sketchy behavior that gets understood using the language of shadowy cabals. And if folks might not be versed in political economy, it's not that hard to see how they could get swept down that rabbit hole. Again, if they are, right, divorced from some really substantial context to be able to parse out where was my good faith intention, right, that might be sincere, that might be rooted in care, be getting manipulated in a particular direction that we can name and that we can historicize and that is actually really important to do, right, because there are real concerns for us to be taking seriously in this moment, whether it's related to actually addressing child abuse or actually, right, addressing problematic clandestine governmental programs. But if we're going to be serious about that, then we need to do our homework in a way that so rarely takes place when people will just kind of casually call themselves researchers, when actuality they're just kind of going down internet rabbit holes that are algorithmically determined for them. And we could also talk about, right, when it comes to QAnon, um, the piece related to Bill Gates, right? Even the very unapologetically leftist, right, podcast citations needed calls Bill Gates one of the handful of, right, most harmful people on the planet. Concerns about that tech bro isn't conspiratorial. I 100% people critically thinking about any kind of imperialist sort of megalomaniacal anti-democratic actor, especially one that has money that allows him a horrific amount of control globally. Why wouldn't we want to be thinking critically about that? Similarly with the right Peter Thiel, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, Mark Zuckerberg, I really support that, even within the framework, say, of professional ethics that we've touched upon earlier in this series. So, for example, Gates has no training in medicine or public health. He's a tech bro, right? Like some hilarious internet memes have named. He couldn't even keep viruses out of Microsoft Word, right? What business does he have trying to be the most authoritative, right, and influential figure, right, in combating viruses like COVID-19? Why should he be able to buy his way into being the single most powerful human driver of the fields of global public health and medicine? For those of us with professional ethics, that's a substantial breach. So for example, my academic training is as a political scientist and a philosopher. That means I'm not going to try to be the loudest, most influential voice in the world in chemistry or architecture. <laughs> Furthermore, though, how often do you see people asking these very simple questions about Gates and his lack of qualifications in the mainstream? I rarely, if ever, see that. So what's the broader context that enables this horrific silence? One, the fact that folks in the settler colonial U.S. rarely hear critique from the global South, right? Additionally, that so often we have this uncritical bias towards tech bros and thinking that they're magical and the vanguard of progress. We'll talk about this more when we get into the weed of scientism later in this season, right? Of course, there's the bias towards thinking white people and Americans and men and rich people, right, know what they're talking about at the expense of all of the rest of us. These are all very relevant constituent parts for us to unpack. And yet, again, unfortunately, when it comes to some sort of internet rabbit holes, that kind of discernment can get distorted in ways that can sort of lend to themselves to lacking the sort of systemic analysis or structural critique that we've been starting to lay out in this past hour. Um, I'll just share a couple more examples real quick, right? We can do a little test. 
So what's a context in which, say, the U.S. Constitution or the Declaration of Independence were constructed? One in which the white property-owning cis male colonizer authors were raping, pillaging, enslaving, and murdering. That's partially what's so tragic about people who have a fetish for the Founding Fathers. Their heroes are hypocrites. Also, we don't even need heroes, right? Or what's the context to give another little thought experiment or example in which the mythology of pilgrims and Indians coming together in Thanksgiving was created? A white supremacist, murderous, death cult, inaugurating the most horrific atrocities in the history of Turtle Island. When people pay attention holistically to context, those evil lies are laid bare for what they are. Hopefully it allows conscience and basic human decency to override any peer pressure to consumerism, wastefulness on a finite planet, or trivializing holocausts. What Dr. Gayatri Spivak named as, quote, countless unrecognized Hiroshima's compared to over-sentimentalized 9-11s in her preface to the film concerning violence. So there are so many other examples that we could get into, although I'm afraid that's all that we really have time for today. So in closing, again, I really want to invite us to just consider what's the context in which we have come to learn things through Wikipedia, through a public school, right? Something that, say, Dr. Leehan Simpson, right, one of the most well-known First Nations scholars and activists in the settler colonial Canadian society would say, right, folks really need to be bailing from, right, as quickly as possible because, right, that system serves to perpetuate settler colonialism. Uh, and so, again, in the realm of indigenous knowledges, how we learn is absolutely consequential, right? And that, right, provides one of the most formidable counters to imperial epistemologies that would pressure us to just kind of sloppily universalize. Um, again, like we see in so many mainstream instances, um, like, for example, the wildly popular American self-help movement where people still, right, are decades, centuries really, behind some of the kinds of theories of knowledge that we've been discussing. So they'll just uncritically generalize, right? So think, for example, of some sort of wannabe thought leaders like Brene Brown just telling people to be vulnerable and in a way that's oblivious to legal ramifications, to oppression, to how we're differentially situated in terms of myriad aspects of reality. So as a solution, right, if those folks want to try to support their audiences, they need to learn how to be humble. That might look like saying this seemed effective for the overwhelmingly or entirely English-speaking, Judeo-Christian, cis, predominantly white U.S. citizens I talked to with. We opened our hearts up and then people met us. Whereas for the rest of us, we can be courageously vulnerable only to have societal biases judge us or to be pitied with condescension or to otherwise have that kind of privilege to generalization backfire on us. So to be continued next week with more weeding and seeding, but in the meantime, please do feel free to share this out if you know anyone that could benefit from some of these reflections, maybe if they are grappling with some of these popular questions in this moment related to, again, do oppressed people know things in some privileged way that other folks can't access, right? To be a little bit more rigorous in terms of taking seriously what knowing is and isn't, who can and can't know, right? How we're capable of embodying wisdom, right being a little more discerning when people are like just be objective I'm fact-based right don't be right value-laden or subjective um, and if you're able to kick down any funds via patreon or PayPal to be able to keep this kind of right independent insurgent intellectual production going that would be sincerely appreciated that is the only way that this happens uh, and please don't plagiarize me so right if you want to share out right feel free to cite your sources that would be rad and much appreciated 
good. So out of respect for y'all's time, we can go ahead and close. I hope to see you next week for some more reading and seeing. Freedom is out. That's it for today's episode of Feral Visions, a decolonial feminist podcast brought to you by Liberation Spring. I've been your host, Anjali Nathupadhyaya, and I thank you for listening. I'm also curious to know what this dialogue evoked for you. I invite you to post your reflections and questions in the comments section below to continue our collective journey of unlearning, remembering, and imagining. If you want to share feedback, such as segment ideas or potential guests you'd like to hear on the show, email liberationspring at gmail.com. And don't forget to follow Feral Visions on SoundCloud or iTunes, where you can find our show archive. If you'd like more information on this show's topic or to donate to the project, check out liberationspring.com. Thanks to Catherine Petru and Nicole Gervasio of our technical production team and Climbing Poetry for our theme song. Be sure to tune in for next week's episode. And in the meantime, let's make our ancestors proud. The power of the people is louder than the evil. Deceitful and coward, people in power. All power to the people, it's the hour of the peaceful. Freedom is ours, yeah. Freedom is ours. Freedom is ours.